Welcome to Business Not 101, hosted by me, Olivier Bousset, founder, entrepreneur, podcast creator. In this episode, we explore the founder's journey from their aha moment to the roadblocks and problems to what they would have done differently in hindsight and the unique solutions they came up with. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, George, how you doing? Good, yourself? Good. Thanks for joining us on Business on 101. So let's just jump right into it. Please introduce yourself and give us your 60 second business pitch. Awesome. So my name is George. I'm the founder and CEO of WaveConnect and WaveConnect provides digital business cards for modern networking, allowing companies to better showcase their brand through the use of digital business cards. So we'll run through exactly what that means today together and how you can leverage this technology to better achieve your goals. Perfect. So what was the aha moment? What was it that struck you to say, this is a project I got to run with? Oh man. Well, the aha moment was pretty much, we've all seen the struggle of using paper business cards from, you know, the simple changing a, you know, one digit on your phone number to having to buy, you know, a couple thousand all over again. And also the statistic that, you know, 90% of people who do receive these paper business cards tend to throw them out within the first week without even inputting that into your phone. So it seemed like in an era where everything is going digital, why are we still stuck to this three by six piece of paper that really does you no good when showcasing your brand or helping business development, right? And that was the aha moment. I was like, why is this still present? There has to be a way to leverage tech to better engage, build meaningful connections and showcase really what you do, seeing that the majority of your brand is actually online. Yeah, that's really a good point. And so when you first started, obviously this is a tech item and a physical item, I believe, right? Exactly. And what were some of the initial roadblocks that you hit when you first launched that you weren't expecting because it's a brand new sort of venture for you? Okay. So roadblocks would definitely be user acquisition as a boots, bootstrap startup. Like people have no idea how hard it is to acquire a customer when you have no name behind you, just a simple MVP and you know, you're struggling just to figure out how do I build a product product that people want and now how do I get people to use it? So one of those roadblocks is how do I get customers to try it out so I can, you know, start this feedback loop of, you know, test, get the feedback from the customers, you know, improve the application, then, you know, go back to testing, feedback, improve, testing, feedback, improve that little flywheel that everybody likes to talk about. So th that was the biggest struggle. We got over it very simply by leveraging TikTok. We leveraged social and organic growth to kind of get the word out there just so that we can start testing it out. And that's kind of how we started getting some traction. That's really interesting. And how did you leverage TikTok? Cause that's the first time somebody's actually said they've used TikTok on this podcast to actually leverage their product. Yeah, funny enough, we, I don't use TikTok anymore, though we're, we're getting back into it. It's The algorithm there is just insane. But the way I leveraged it was was pretty simple. I, I took my phone out. We had like the basic MVP. The card used to only be able to share your information one way on somebody's contact book. And uh, what, we, what I simply did was I took a bunch of videos of myself using the product and I started posting just consistently for... Well, consistently, I posted for like a few months and what I ended up doing was I was leveraging the reach of TikTok. I would direct people from TikTok onto a $30 landing page that I did on MailChimp from there, collect emails. And at one point after like two months of just posting this, you know, there's, there's not much we can do other than tap, right? It was an MVP. So I would post 10, 20, 30 videos of me tapping the phone over and over again. And then eventually we had close to a thousand people on the wait list over two months. And yeah, I, I took those people from the wait list, created a Shopify store and then started pre-orders, got some validation I needed and some revenue before we even started. And I was like, okay, it's, it's time to start something because there seems to be a little bit of interest here. So that's really interesting. So leveraging TikTok right to a landing page and uh, MailChimp. Yeah. That's something that a lot of people don't think of when they want to validate their product. And that's a great idea. I love that. And sort of looking back at it, if from the day you started now with more experience, would you go back and do the same thing? Or would you now look at it and say, no, I would have changed the way that I would approach that early phase of getting inquiring customers? Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten to the point I am today if I didn't go through those steps. So I wouldn't do it any other way, though. It is a good point to mention here is 
B2B is always easier, easier than B2C. So if I were to start a new idea, even with Wave, you know, we've pivoted from the B2C play to the B2B play. If I were to start over again, I might have focused on that B2B part. It's just easier to sell to businesses. They, they have the budget. They understand the value. It's easier to sell to them than it is to an individual. You know, sometimes it's not too rational, but. It is very true though. I think B2B is an easier target because you know the pain point and you can focus on that. Whereas a customer may have variations that they're looking at their pain point. That's a great point. Yeah, exactly. Did, one of the questions I always ask people is, did you have a business mentor or a business coach that helped you at the early phase? So I never had a business mentor or coach until I started Wave. So it wasn't like I had built a pipeline of mentors that were helping me along the way. And I finally got this realization and started. No, I, when I had first started, then I was like, oh man, I think I need a mentor because I can leverage their experience to kind of dodge all the, the potholes. So funny enough, I reached out to Kevin Conabry on LinkedIn. He's a Techstars alumni. And I literally just got on the phone with him and I told him, well, I sent him a message saying, hey man, just looking to get in touch. I have a pretty cool idea and I want to run it by you. And he was like, sure, call me. So I gave him a call. We started talking, gave me some ideas. And then we just kept this line of communication and now he's, he's helping us on wave as well. So super, that's really, that's, that's kind of a cool way to go around it. Yeah. And did you find now looking back at your early stages and perhaps even other past businesses that you would have benefited from getting a, a business mentor right away or, or a business coach with this experience? And would you suggest people listening to say, Hey, you know what? You'd be way better off. Definitely. Like if find a mentor in your vertical, like. If you're in tech, find a mentor in tech. If you're in real estate, find a mentor in real estate and, and, and stick to that because you want to leverage the experience that they've built up over the years. You know, definitely listen to your mentor. I didn't listen to mine sometimes. He had told me to pivot to B2B way earlier than I had actually realized it. So they definitely know a lot more and they've been in the business. Um, so it, it's definitely good to leverage a mentor for sure. I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I think it gives you a great experience to listen to somebody else's point of view. And it's, it's so true. Looking back at people who've experienced it with a business coach or a business mentor, it does give you a lot more, I think, I sort of bandwidth to be able to look at things in a different light than you would normally. So yeah, it's a great point. Sort of looking back at your early acquisitions, now you did a really unique way of using TikTok to leverage that yeah. to a landing page. But since then, how have you continued to create your pipeline to create your greater or to increase the size of your community? What are some of the ways yeah. you're currently doing it? Yeah. So again, like it's, it's super tough when you're bootstrapped because you don't have a lot of, you know, disposable cash to throw on, on ads. So you have to get creative with it. And a lot of the things we've done is we've partnered with schools. And we've partnered with associations across Canada from, you know, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Montreal's my city, JMSB, John Molson's, you know, they know exactly what's up. So if they see this podcast, they've supported me quite a lot. I can name hundreds of people right now who have supported Wave and, and you know, help with getting that user acquisition. So I, I owe a lot of it to them because they took a chance of me and I took a chance with them. But uh, yeah, for sure, it was leveraging you know, these, these students who are super interested in trying new tech. And from there, we were able to get into a lot of events to test the cards out when the students are using them. And then it just starts growing and growing the user base. These students then expose Wave to all these recruiters who work at, you know, Deloitte, KPMG, MNP, you know, you name it, all these big companies. And then those big companies see the value, try it out and then end up reaching out to us. We do little outbound, it's a lot of inbound, but we're starting to structure our, our, our operations in a way where we'll have a sales team, we'll be able to do a lot of cold outreach so that we can leverage both inbound traffic and outbound. That's a really interesting, I like that. So sort of giving out freebies to students and to your alumni, and then basically letting them become your spokespeople. Yeah. Do you guys also do a referral program? Because I mean, it's a consumer good still from a B2B concept, right? Because it's something that people walk around with. Do you also offer a referral program to grow your business? So we have an affiliate program where we pay our affiliates, you know, for, for any sales that they do help, um, help us get. But to your point, what we want to do is ingrain a referral program inside the product. So we leverage some like product led growth strategies where 
you know, every time a non-wave user is connecting with a wave user, they'll be able to instantly create a profile. And that's going to create that flywheel where, you know, it just keeps adding on to the pool of users. The bigger the user base, you get to a point of critical mass, and then it just starts growing, growing. Yeah, I think that's in most businesses, if not, I would say almost 80% referral programs is where they get their business from, which is really funny. Yeah. And it's a, it's a tough one to sort of conquer because asking people straight out, like, could you find me people? It's not easy. So it's a, it's a unique situation. Yeah, for sure. With, with the referral programs too, it's like we can ask businesses to refer us to other businesses. But I, I think where the refer, referral program gets really cool, especially when you're in tech, is leveraging, leveraging some sort of ingrained referral program in your product so that you know, you don't need to do any outreach. The people are actually referring each other over and over again. So like I'm a wave user, I go to an event, I tap my card on somebody's phone and then, you know, they experience wave and then they'll be able to instantly create an account. So it's some sort of referral through somebody who's already using it. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's really good. And I, and I had a question about actually your product. When you click or you tap someone's phone, does it automatically bring them to your site or does it automatically just transfer the information or do they need the application as well? So there's no app required to use Wave. So typically it opens up on you know Safari, Chrome, any type of browser. So the reason for that is it makes it so much more accessible. If, if somebody suppo supposedly taps that card and then it asks you to download an app, you know, you're probably not going to download the app. So opening in a browser, that much easier for both parties. So typically the way it will work is, you know, you tap the card and then it would open up a custom branded page that you can you know, customize the way you like, add your socials, websites, images, lead forms, your branding, colors, you name it, you can do it. And then from there, you'll be able to exchange contact information with each other. And it's a little more than that as well. We started pivoting towards the business. The business, how can we help a business better achieve their goals through whether that's a marketing goal or whether that's an HR goal. So we're working on that as well. Yeah, that's a great lead in because I, one of my questions was, did you pivot? And obviously at the beginning you said we went from B2C to B2B and that's a great point. Now you're pivoting even more so towards individual, uh, the sort of business units. And that's interesting. Is there a some someone you would have hired right from the get-go looking back and saying i should have hired this kind of person or this person to really sort of boost myself up because i've struggled or i'm doing something i'm doing three people's jobs instead of just doing concentrating on one yeah damn uh, <laughs> that's a great question so definitely needed a software developer which we had but if i aside from that since we're a tech company the, the first hire i would have done would have been a creative director that can leverage organic social to get as much outreach as possible. I find like there's so much opportunity right now with Facebook feed, Reels, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, you name it. You can get so far as a brand if you're able to tell your story of the company, what you're doing, be completely real, show all the emotions, all the ups, all the downs. And that's how you build community. And when you build community and you're engaged in organic social, you're gonna be leagues, leagues ahead of anybody else. So if I were to go back in time and, and get somebody on board, definitely a creative director, somebody to just record the whole journey with me, you know, be able to edit it and then post it on all these socials. That's a great point. I, I find that a lot of people try to take on marketing themselves and marketing is like a huge beast on any startup. Yeah. And it's a very expensive endeavor to hire somebody, but I, it's one of those weird situations where like, you know enough about marketing, but you don't really know enough in marketing in startups because it becomes overwhelming. So uh, that and sales is probably the two things that I think are the most complicated in the startup world. And sort of my next question is, how do you guys currently do your sales? Is it all online or are you physically having people come to businesses or is it just whatever comes in? Yeah, so fortunately and unfortunately, it's whatever comes in. So fortunately, because there's stuff coming in and unfortunately, because we're not doing outbound. Typically right now, the, the way our sales process works is a lot of it actually comes from some sort of like quote unquote referral, right? We have hundreds of students at recruitment events using Wave and um, just by, I would say co collateral damage, right? They're, they're using it. And then these businesses are coming to us saying, hey, how can we leverage Wave to better you know, achieve our goals? So whether typically it's a lot of HR representatives that come to us and say, hey, there's a big hole with LinkedIn right now. When you connect with 100, 200, 300 different individuals, the big problem is you can't keep track or keep in touch with these individuals because a lot of HR reps have close to 
you know, 20,000 followers already. So they're like, how can we better manage all these potential candidates and direct them to the correct information? So they come to us with this problem and, and we solve it for them. But typically the way the sales pipeline works right now is, is all inbound. It's they're coming to us. We're not being able to go to them just yet, but it's something we're going to do, you know, by November. Yeah. So. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was what my next <laughs> question is like, so I was going to give you even more time than November, but uh, what, what's sort of like the key tools you're going to be looking at to integrate more sales? You know, is it going to be bodies, people in the street, feet on the ground, or are you looking for, you know, software tools to be, take that over? So I've tried some software tools, some that automate LinkedIn messages and things of that nature. I find nowadays you just got to focus on your strong points, right? My strong point, and, and this is a cool story, actually. I took a massive pay cut from the banking industry. I used to work in corporate banking, public equities, working you know a lot on the back end with stocks. And eventually I left that job to take a, a tech sales role at a fintech here in Montreal because every entrepreneur that I know know sale ver sales very well. They understand the sales pipeline, how to get clients, what's the, you know, what's the structure of, of sales and how it works, what tools to use. So I, I did, I knew I was going to go into the entrepreneur game eventually and the startup world. So uh, I jumped to learn sales myself to figure out how to do it. I learned from some pretty good people and lucky for me, I, I know exactly what, what to do next. But then what was the question? Sorry, I pivoted way too much. <laughs> That's okay. It happens. <laughs> so what tools are you going to use? And yeah, so now you've sort of looked at yourself. Bodies. Oh, you're yeah. the salesperson, right? This is the most common in most founders and startups. So, but now to move your business next way, are you planning to bring in software such as, you know, SMS or messaging? And then you say, I'm going to use virtual sales or I'm going to bring people physically in and let them become, you know, people that call people or walk to companies. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's going to be people who are going to do cold calls from there. We're going to, you know, push them to a demo, understand their problem because wave is super customizable, right? There's a lot of funnels that we really help in, which is marketing and engaging people with your brand sales to better manage your business development and share leads across your organization. And then HR to better manage potential candidates and direct them to the correct job postings. So there's three main verticals that we work in, but at the same time, there's many other ways that we can help. So what I like to do is really have like a customized demonstration with them, understand their problem, what goals they're trying to achieve. And the best way to do that is to have a personalized experience through a demo. So, so that's why we've taken that route instead of a self-serve onboarding where you just go on a website and, and sign up. Yeah, perfect. That's, that's really interesting. And this leads me well into my next question, which is where do you see your business in five years or hope to see it? Wow, that's a big question. It's so funny because like 12 months ago, I would have said like, we want to get this out across to the majority of people in Montreal. And now, you know, we're, we're thinking bigger and bigger. And it seems like the business just keeps pivoting, right? It's, it's like, what way can we survive as a bootstrap company and, you know, increase our return on investment as much as possible, while at the same time, building something meaningful and great that people are going to use going forward. And really, you know, in, in five in five years, it's definitely going to be a company that's going to support other companies in, in achieving those specific goals that I mentioned for marketing, sales, and HR. We want to build a platform as well where we're helping people build more meaningful connections. I think a lot of people have been disconnected since COVID. A lot of it is coming back into play, events, everything seems to be back to normal. But we want to leverage the tech that we have today to be able to match people with other individuals locally, to, you know, to increase their network. Because the, the reason I'm here today is because I networked so much, you know, five years ago and it, it's compounding. The more people you meet, the more doors that open, right? People open doors for people. So if there's a way we can connect two people together and help them build something great, then that'd be amazing. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's something that even with events, it's pre COVID, post COVID is the most complicated thing to do. If you don't yeah. have a unique event or great host that really can sort of push people together. I've seen a lot of times you end, a lot of people end up being wallflowers at a networking event, which is sort of strange. Cause you're thinking you have to network. And I'm like, I'm an introvert <laughs> by nature, but I really push myself when I'm networking and it's awkward, but I see still people sitting back and I think, yeah, anything that can help people is really important. And I think that's a great selling feature. Yeah. So now my next question, 
if you could leave yourself a voicemail for your former beginning self, what would it be? What would you say to yourself saying, hey, watch out for this, or you got to do this? Oh, damn. I would say it only gets harder. That That's what I would tell him. <laughs> I would tell him, I would say, you know, George, you're going to build something, and I'm telling you it's only going to get harder. It doesn't get easier. It's only more stress, more worries, more hard work, especially when you start onboarding employees because, I, you know, a lot of people say your employees aren't your family, but they are because you're responsible for them as well, right? You're helping them put food on the table. You're you're there supporting them also. So it only gets more stressful, only gets harder. So make sure that going forward, your mindset's bulletproof to get through those ups and downs. That's great. That's a great point. Yeah, I love that. All right, I'm going to switch gears now and we're going to go learn more about you, the entrepreneur. Sure. So my first question is what makes you productive as an entrepreneur? Oh my God, I'm an analytics freak, man. Crazy. So... I, I track my productivity using an app called Forest. So it's a productivity. So I have a big problem with productivity. If I'm not tracking it, I'm not doing it. There could be a fly in the room that's going to distract me. I can, you know, look out the window, be distracted for half an hour, an hour. I'll randomly get up just to get water, even though I have a bottle in front of me. So it's a lot of, of that. So what I do need is some sort of placebo effect in a, in a way to get me to focus. So what I do is I have this Forest app. And it's a timer. It's a Promodoro timer. That's what they call it. And then you just start. And after 45 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever timer you set, you know, it grows a, a digital tree. And then from there, you know, the more trees you grow on that app, you can actually use those points to, to plant real trees in Kenya. So it's a win-win situation. I'm productive and I'm helping plant trees. But to be productive, I have to track it. And at the same time, I have to manage the food I eat. If you eat a lot of processed food and junk, you tend to not focus, get tired around two, three o'clock. So I always have to make sure that I can keep up with the full day because, you know, I, I don't just work from, from nine to five. I typically work from, from nine to nine. Now, obviously there's, there's points where I take a break. I'm not a continuous hustler, but uh, I track my sleep and I track my exercise. So I track how much work I do, sleep, exercise, and food. That's really interesting. I've never heard of that app. So I use a timer myself, which is an actual like a timer, a square timer. I can't show it here, but you just turn it and you put it into the time, 60 minutes or half hour, 20 minutes. And I'm the same way. If you give me a bit of freedom, I'm on TikTok. I'm walking my dog. <laughs> I'm talking to the neighbors. And then, <laughs> then the day's gone. I'm like, well, I didn't get anything done. So that's great. I love that. I love that app. Sort of sticking to, and I was going to ask you, you know, the, the next question, but you answered it, which was a software or tool. But what is one strength that you feel is most important as an entrepreneur? Yeah. One strength is to not think as much. And it, it, it shocks people to think like, oh, no, I'm not supposed to think. It's just think less and start doing. Because the more you think, the more your mind starts playing tricks on you of how many ways this could potentially fail. So typically I think my greatest strength is I just test by doing, and then I analyze the results and see which way I should go forward. And that's what, I, that's just from my opinion, the best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, don't overthink it, just get to it. So that's really intelligent. I like that. I like that. So you'll never know, you'll my... never know until you try it. Right. So, well, that's it. That's it. I think a lot of it as an entrepreneur is definitely just testing out and listening to people. And I think this is why I do the podcast. It allows people to have an opportunity to listen to what works for you. It doesn't mean it work for them, but sometimes we get so caught up in the stories that we read. We don't think about like there's actual entrepreneurs living it and let's hear what they have to say about it. And that's why I like to ask the questions about, you know, personal, like how do you get through productivity? How do you get through hardships? Because I think that's important for people to hear as well. Definitely. So one of my one of the questions I really love is as an entrepreneur, who would you go for coffee with a famous entrepreneur that you could say, Hey, I'd love to go and pick this person's brain. Who would it be and why? So I don't know if he could be put in the basket of entrepreneur, but Jordan Peterson. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. He's I a controversial find... person. Yes. He's, he's definitely a controversial person. I think he, what he does is, is backed by a lot of good. I'd love, that's somebody I'd just love to sit down and really pick at his brain. And uh, there's, there's no really reason to it. I just find that he, he's, a, he's a type of character that I'd love to go have coffee with. You know, a lot of people might say Elon Musk, he could be next, 
but <laughs> I get that all the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but but to be honest, it, it would be Jordan Peterson. There's a lot of things he says that that resonate with me, so I'd love to talk with him. That's what a lot of people have said about him. You're the first person on the show who's brought him up, but yeah, he's he has a sort of two sides to him, but he is a very intelligent person. So that's yeah. interesting. Next question is what. What book would you suggest entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs read, whether nonfiction or fiction, but which books that, well, that changed your course? So definitely top of the list, can't go wrong with this one, is The Lean Startup. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a very solid one. I've read it probably three, four times. There's so much gold in that book for, for entrepreneurs. And you know, if you don't want to read it, it's super simple. Test and pivot every single time, every single day. Try new things. See what works, pivot, try new things, see what works, pivot. That's kind of the lean startup in 10 seconds. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one. One I like too is the right it, which I found was very similar to the, the lean startup after I have, and I do audiobooks because as I walk my dog, because if I sit down and read, I get, I just get distracted. So I do the audiobooks. The, the right it? The right it actually, I find it very similar in many aspects, not completely, obviously, but it's very similar in the sense of, you know, finding your right it. So whenever I think of lean startup, I think of that book as well. Nice. I think some other good ones to mention would be like zero to one blue, o blue ocean strategy was another good one there's, there's quite a few, but yeah, a lot of them are That's on good. my bookshelf right there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And I think it's really important for people to understand how many books out there can really change their course of their, their, their work, because I think a lot of people sort of look at, ah, I'm going to read one book and I'm going to launch a business, you know, and it's like, no, you need a lot of reading before or listening to audiobooks, but you know, to get going. So that's interesting. All right. Thank you very much. So my last question to you is how can people reach out and connect with you? Yeah. So I don't know if you're going to put a link in the podcast, I can send you my wave profile from there. They'll be able to see all my brand in one place. They'll be able to reach me on any socials, my contact info, email. I love to support, you know, entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs. So if you ever need to run something by me, I'm always available and we could break it down. Perfect. I will be adding that to our show notes and as well. So anybody can reach out to you directly or through LinkedIn and so on, but perfect. That's awesome. great. I do have a question for you, though. I have to ask you a question, you know, because you're, you're, you're talking with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? So I, I don't know if anybody's asked you this question yet, but but why have you started something yourself? What, what was the, that reason? So that's a great question. Thank you very much. I actually started this podcast because I used to do a meetup with a friend of mine called The Entrepreneur's Journey, and we would get together and, and we get about 100 or so people that would show up at WeWork. And we would bring some founders and usually around very specific core, like marketing or, or, or sales. And people would always have these very specific questions and we had closed it down. We were planning to pivot it. And when COVID came, we kind of stopped it and the question still came into me. And so one day I said, well, let me start a podcast and I get to meet entrepreneurs. And I get to listen to amazing stories, but as well, I get to ask them those core questions that people have and wishes put together in this show. That's a great answer. <laughs> thank you very much. And thanks for asking. Yeah, so I no wanna, worries. I want to say thank you again for uh, coming on the show. It was great having you. And we'll let Being here. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today and listening to this episode of Business Not 101. I hope that this interview gave you some valuable insights and that will help you along your business journey. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to reach out to me. And as always, please like, share, and follow. Thank you. Until next episode.